you all are very good listeners. Remembered well. I don't know who went and fetched that for me, but uh, I do appreciate it so much. Jake, did you do that? No. <laughs> did you hide it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad that it was retrieved and it may come in handy before we're finished tonight. I, w- I want to uh, just ask you tonight to focus for just a moment on things that are coming down. We live in a society right now that is really good at building things up. Unfortunately, a lot of things and they're building up are not good things at all. Not good for our society, not good for us personally. And so I want to talk to you tonight about the things that are coming down. I guess it would be fair to say that uh, things have been building up for quite some time. I'm old enough that I can recall a different society than what we're living in right now. When things were not as they are now. Now are you saying to me, you say, Brother John, are, are you really trying to say to me that things are not as good now as they used to be? And I'm not going to get into that argument. I'm, I'm old and smart enough not to do that, but I can tell you this. I can tell you there's a lot about our our present society that doesn't even come close to comparing with the way that things were before we started building things up and not really considering those things that we were building at the time. So uh, let me just give you a few things to start with tonight that have become the inventions of mankind and then been realized in our day and time. First of all, We've made for ourselves new rules that give way to or give way to humanistic desires. I don't know if you've noticed how many things have been adopted. Uh, in uh, you know, I'm not here to fight some uh, philosophical battles about uh, humankind tonight, but I will say this: I, I've been watching just enough TV to know that there's a swimmer that's. Uh, that's winning all the races now. A lady, uh, or well, wait a minute. Uh, uh, someone who swims. And, uh, and the, 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 the question is, can someone who is a, a six foot two inch male uh, decide that he wants to identify as a woman and, uh, and then participate in women's sports and, and make it almost impossible for them to win in the things that he's competing in? And you say, well, wait a minute, it is, it is common knowledge that you ought not ever refer to someone uh, in a gender that they do not identify with. And that may be uh, well and good in this society that has built this up. But the truth of the matter is, God has never changed. And he's never going to change. He, he made us all the way, the, the, as a matter of fact, the Bible says he made us in his image. He, he really made us the way he wanted us to be. But yet we have used this humanism and it's, it's all of its tenets to, to build things up and say these are acceptable. When in God's eyes, they're not acceptable at all. Now, I don't think I need the bell to, to, to get you, the most of you to agree with that. But, but let, me, let me just move on a little bit. We've also built up walls that allow evil to permeate good while preventing good from having access to equal opinion. For some reason, we think that it's fashionable to allow people to tear down what is good and what is of God, but never be able to speak the same way about things that are evil. And, and are the things that are beneficial to the devil. It's the craziest thing I ever saw, but we've built that up. Also, we have elevated hatred, the best tool of the devil, to a position of supremacy in the minds of most Americans. We have built up a wall that makes us distrust, and in fact, many of us hate people only because of their philosophies or the color of their skin or who knows how many other reasons that we have divided ourselves. We have built that up. That's not the way God intended things. Never did, never will. That's not the way he flies. But we have built it up ourselves. 
We've also created a wall between science and faith. We've produced millions of young Americans who have no belief in God. That's not something that we ought to be standing back and talking about how good a job we've done. Instead, we ought to be ashamed of what we've allowed to take place in this land that we call America. Amen. Now, I don't know what you all think about that. Don't really care right now. But I, I, I have a good news for you. It's all going to come down. Sooner or later, all that we are building up that is anti-God will come down. Now, lastly here, before I move away from this, we have a, built this image of success that includes houses, cars, money in the bank, popularity, and all those sort of things. But friend, that's not success. You can live in this world and find everything this world has to offer and find it easy and then discover in the very end that that was not God's will for you nor for anyone else that you know. God has said that if I didn't build it, I'll tear it down. His word is plain about that. I'm not going to stand up here and quote scripture after scripture because I've already been told tonight that I'm a little wordy with the scripture. They were kidding, I'm sure. All right, never trust a pilot. I have really good news to share with you today. All the aforementioned things are going to come down. And history has recorded for us that every time an evil permeates a society, things even like Hitler's Reich, Reich I'm sorry, will emerge. And it falls down in the end. Nothing that God has not built up will stand. It's all coming down. Now, years ago, I was still a brand new Christian, hadn't been saved but maybe a, but two years at the most. A man joined the church where Sherry and I were members, and uh, he was, let's just say he talked a lot. He was an older man and had a very young wife, and they joined the church, and they were uh, sort of different than the regular membership of that church. This man was very rich, and he wanted everybody to know it. Now, I didn't know a whole lot about Christianity at that time, but I certainly knew a little bit about people. That man was so full of hot air that every time he tutored his horn, his mouthpiece melted. Whenever he began to talk right then and there, you knew that what, what you were getting ready to hear was just fluff. But I did believe that he was rich. He had a brand new Cadillac. He lived in the biggest house just about in Benton, Illinois. And by the way, he dressed the part and he talked the part and, and he, he just let everybody know that hey, he had lots of money. So one day he invited me to his home, not because he liked me or anything like that. It was because of the business that Sherry and I were in at the time. He wanted me to come and look at the plumbing in his house. And I have to admit I was a little bit inquisitive, so I went. We got uh, through with the advice that he sought. And he said, would you like to see the rest of my house? I said, yeah, I think I would. I mean, after all, it was a three-story house. I'd never been in a three-story house. And, and uh, it, the, the first floor and the second floor looked almost identical. They each had a kitchen and all the living area and all the bedrooms and everything. But there was a third floor on this house. And I was really secretly wanting to see that third floor. So we went in and it was one humongous bedroom and the biggest closet I ever saw in my life. That closet was as big as some people's houses, and all along one wall, there were doors. You could open the doors and, and, and see different compartments in the closet. When he started pulling back the doors, I noticed that there was nothing in that closet but shoes, women's shoes. Many of them never worn Brand spanking new. And I thought, you know, this sugar daddy is a real shoe salesman's friend. Amen? He had bought his little precious bride anything that she wanted for such a long, long time that he had literally thousands of dollars of women's shoes. It was like that Marcos woman from years ago. Some of you never heard of her, but anyway, she, she was, I think, from the Philippines and had... Uh, I forget how many, uh, like a million dollars worth of shoes. I don't think there were that many in this house, but there were a lot. And so then he, he told me, 
you know, he said, I, I know that, that you're kind of a new Christian. And he said, maybe I shouldn't be asking you this question. But he said, you can tell that I've got money. And I said, well, it appears that way. And then he said, well, I've got a dilemma. He said, I made all this money in Chicago. Beware of Chicago. Some real bad things come out of Chicago. I came out of Chicago. All right? He said, what I want to do is use the money for the Lord. And I said, well, that is admirable, you know. And he said, uh, well, there's quite a bit of it. Good. And I said, uh, and what kind of business were you in? And he said, well, you, you could say I was in the insurance business. And I said, well, tell me what that means. And he said, well, it means that what I used to do was I had crews that, that went in and, and, and took care of things that had burned or had a flood in the house or whatever. And, and my crews went in and made it like new. And he said, but that's not where the money came from. He said, the money came from an insurance executive that was my friend in the business, so I turned in a much higher bill each time and he and I split the overage. And I'd like to know, what do you think about me giving a lot of that money to the church? I said, you don't have enough money. What do you mean I don't have enough money? I said, you do not have enough money. The scripture says, you'll come up short. And he said, and where would that be? And I said, it's in Exodus chapter 22, verse 9. It says it very plain. I'll read it for you right now. For all manner of trespass, whether it be for an ox, an ass, a sheep, or a raiment, or any manner of lost thing, which another challenges to be his, the cause of both parties will come before the judges, and when the judge will condemn, he shall pay double unto his neighbor. And he said, you think that means that I'm supposed to give double back whatever, what I took wrong? And I said, exactly what I mean. I kind of felt my spiritual oats at that point. And uh, he let me know that my brashness was not appreciated. And I told him I'd see him at church. But there came a day when that young wife and her shoes left. All of a sudden the closet was empty. The house was empty. She knew more about lawyers than she did where he got his money. And she ended up with it. And I recall so much how broken that man was and finally died with a broken heart. Young wife was gone. All of his money was gone. And I want to use that just for a springboard tonight to say that whatever is achieved, whatever is attained, without God being the source, one day will all come down. Doesn't matter how much you have, if you didn't get it the right way, it will come down. You know, our Lord has control of his universe. And he's never fooled by the connivances of men, nor is he deceived by our pretenses. God doesn't forget anything. I have two places I want you to look now. Galatians chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 6. Galatians 6, 7 says this, don't be deceived. This is a Holman Christian Standard Version, by the way. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Now, isn't that pretty plain? That we get Exactly what we have sowed. If we sow something that, that is, is a stench in the nostrils of God, you're going to get a pretty smelly return. But if what you have sowed is what God wanted you to sow, you're going to have a, a, a really, really sweet deal with God because he does give according to, to those, those, par, uh, those rules right there. In Hebrews chapter 6 verse 4, listen to this. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost 
and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes oft upon it and brings forth herbs for meat for them by whom it is dressed receives blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. Friend, that tells us very plainly, if it's not the right stuff, God will not accept it for long. Sooner or later, it will come down. Now there's coming a day of reckoning. I've said all this to get to this. Things are going to come down to rubble from which they were conceived. I'm convinced, and you don't have to be, and most of you will, will sit there tonight and say, that old codger is like everybody who grows old. They think the Lord is coming at any minute because they've already lived their lives. But friend, I want you to know that I really do believe from the bottom of my heart and what little brain I have that God is coming soon. We better be ready. And those things that we are building, we better make sure that that's what God wanted built. Because if it's not, it's coming down. Doesn't matter if it's church. Doesn't matter who the individual is. Governments are not accepted. Everything that does not have God's stamp of approval on it will come down. Now having said that, I want to show you about three things tonight, maybe four if, if you listen quicker. I want you to see that that which has refused to recognize God as God will come down. You know, right now we are seeing a madman, a literal crazy person, hold the whole world at bay with threats of nuclear warfare. His name is Putin. What a name. You'll get that on your way home. But I, I want you to know this man is not just hot air. This, this man is there for this time. How far will he go? I don't know. And I haven't come to try to scare anybody. I just want you to know that things are as uncertain right now as at any time in my lifetime. Who knows what he's liable to do? We know right now that he's killing men and women and children, bombing things there in, U in the Ukraine like, like I've, I've never seen it before. Kindergartens, hospitals, any place is a target. This is a crazy man. And having said that, friend, I want you to know that all of that is based upon the fact that he will not recognize God as being God. As a matter of fact, he wants to destroy anything that really points to what we believe is God. Now, in Genesis chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, we read a story about a time when the whole earth had a different idea about who God was. It says, at one time, the whole earth had the same language and vocabulary. As people migrated from the east, they found a valley in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And they said to each other, come, let us make oven-fired bricks. And they used brick for stone and asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we'll be scattered all over the face of the whole earth. And then the Lord came down to look over the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, if they have begun to do this as one people, all having the same language, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babylon. For there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth. And from there the Lord scattered them all over the face of the whole earth. Now I've told you that story and I hope that you'll see the correlation for today. Because we're living in a time where 
There are people who want to combine everything in the world together. There's two different philosophies doing this. One of them is, is uh, uh, quite honestly, being driven by some folks who are pretty conservative in their thinking. They somehow or other think that if they get all of the, the, the nations together and they can finally stamp out the evil in the world and it's all going to be good because they're going to have one language again and they're going to have one, one religion again and all, everything's going to be the same. One government, everything's just going to be really good for everybody. But then there's other folks like Mr. Putin's bunch and the folks that he can gather on his side. And what they have decided is what they can do is threaten with great, great weapons of mass destruction and cause people to bow to their will and pretty soon they will overcome all of the rest of the world and they will build an empire like this world has never seen. That is what they have in mind. That is exactly what Mr. Putin and his generals have in store for everybody unless something happens. God comes and turns it all around on a diamond. I think you'll do it. I really think this might be the beginning of the end. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like, yeah, I've heard this before and time again and time again. But friend, I really think this may be it. Well, these folks were building a shrine to the heavenly bodies. Not God, not Jehovah, but the planets. And they were seeking a way that they could see them even clearer that they could climb up in that tower and get such a good idea of what the planets looked like so they could worship them. As you know, the closest thing to us was the moon. They were especially interested in the moon. Look at where it's at, Babylon. And it'll be easy for you to see that prior to Mohammed, they worshiped the moon. Have you ever went by a mosque? If you have, you'll notice that on the roof of those things, there's a crescent moon. That was Allah. That's who they worshipped prior to Muhammad. Now supposedly he is the prophet. But they worshipped the moon god. They were building a monument to the moon god. But they even named their days by all of those heavenly bodies. Saturday was Saturn. I used to know them all, and I'm not even going to try them all tonight, but literally, that's the way that we were getting our names for the days of the week, was from those deities so-called that they were worshiping. For them, their strength and their destiny rested in their remaining the same in the one place. They did not want to be scattered. They did not want to be divided. They did not want different nationalities. What they wanted was everybody in the same place permanently, never to leave that spot. They had found this utopia and said, here, we can settle down. We can all be one together. But that's not God's intention for them at all. See, when God sent people out of the garden, it was to fill the earth with mankind. It was not to stay in one place. It was not to take up residence right there and say, this is what we're building up. This is for the glory of mankind. Look at what we've done. We figured out who God is. They pointed to those heavenly bodies and said, now we're okay. Look at what we've done together. But friend, I got news for you. Anytime God sees society acting that way, it's all going to come down. It came down for them not in the way that most people say today. They say the Tower of Babel fell down. I can't find that in the Bible, but I do find where he messed up their language and that caused them to be scattered. See, Genesis 127 gives us a pretty good picture of it. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's what they were to do. They were to scatter out over the whole earth. But they didn't want to do that. He told them to subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every living thing that moved upon the earth. But they thought as long as we can understand each other, 
And long as we should stay in this one place and all work together for the common good, then everything's going to be fine. That was the first attempt at communism. You know, we're right back where we started at the tower. Listen to me carefully. We're still trying to seek that one world religion. That one great power under the guise of humanity rules. God has never allowed humanity to rule. And he's not going to now. He sent his son because we were a fallen race. All of us. All of us come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Isn't that what the Bible says? There's never a time when we have gotten so good that God looked down and said, now look at him. Boy, this is, this is going to be cool for everybody now. No way. Instead, what he's done is he's looked down time and time and time again and said, they're rotten to the core and I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to knock it down. And I believe he's getting ready to do it again. And you say, boy, I hope it's not soon because, you know, so-and-so's not saved. That's a good reason to get revived, church. Start reaching out as hard as you can right now. For those people staying in that one place and understanding each other, that was where it was all at. And friend, that brings me to this point, and I hope that you'll listen intently to this section. All those who have settled on self-determination are going to come down. All those who are looking to self for your sufficiency, it will all come down. It happens when people set out to do things without God. No matter what the cause, nothing done without God is going to stand. Governments will fall. If we don't turn back to, to God, America, we are going to fall. There's no doubt. You say, oh no, we're different. We're not like all the other societies that have come before us. I got news for you. God has blessed many societies in the past and he may do more in the future, I don't know. But I do know this. Every time that they become corrupt in their morals, they begin to look to other things for their source. God has caused it to fall down each and every time. Economies will crumble. Right now we're looking around and we're seeing all these gas prices and the grocery prices and all that and saying, oh my goodness, this is terrible and look, look, boy, we just can't wait till so-and-so gets elected. Friend, I got news for you. It doesn't matter right now who's in office. Economies that are built on something other than trusting God are going to see those economies come down. Sooner or later, it will happen. Now some of you don't look like you believe me. So let me get right where you live. Superficial relationships without God's participation will always fail. It wasn't long ago I had a couple come to me and they said, we want to get married. Are you a Christian? Yes. Are you? No. Then I said, I can't do that. Won't do that. Never done that, don't intend to now. If you can't profess that Jesus is the Lord, I'm not going to do that. You know why? Because anything built without God's blessing on it, anything that's built in spite of his commands and his rules will come down. Do you want to know why we are in a society tonight that's having so much trouble with relationships? Folks, I've never seen anything like this. It's the craziest thing I ever saw. I pastor a church, as, as some of you know, that's not nearly as big as this one right now. But I can tell you that on the pews, on any given Sunday morning, counting the ones that I've already convinced they needed to get right with God and get married, and the ones who have not done it yet, there can be as many as 12 to 15 couples sitting on those pews that would fit into that definition. And you say, how can they do that? Let me help you. They put it in their minds that they can build a philosophy of religion that says it's okay to be shacked up. Look up here at me. That's a lie of the devil. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking oh my goodness, Brother John, you crossed the line. No, they crossed the line. It's not me. I'm just telling you what the truth is. If it's not built on God, get prepared. It's coming down. 
And church, I want you to know tonight that whatever you build right here on this hill, it better be for the glory of God and not for the glory of man or for anything else because if it's not built right, it will fall every time. Does anybody believe me tonight? I sure hope so. Let me move just a little bit further. I probably haven't offended enough people yet. We have misdefined independent living. Today, the term is taken to, to mean those who want community living but are still able to take care of their own basic needs. And that's a good way to define it. But God sees it every day in the lives of those people who for the most part are living without giving him a thought. We're going to have to stop letting people believe that it's, it's going to be the same outcome for folks who know God and really respect God and all the other folks. It's not going to turn out well for them. Those who do not love the Lord are going to feel his wrath. Let me share something with you. There is a place called hell. It's hot. It's always going to be hot. And when folks die without Christ, they do not go and get burned up and then everything is just annihilation. No, the word says that their worm dieth not. That's not talking about a little wiggly worm crying, crawling around like a maggot. Instead, it's talking about the life principle. They'll never die. If they go to hell, they will spend eternity in hell. Do you understand that that's eternity in the eternal fires of hell? But sometimes we don't see that. We see people and we look at them and we say, oh, you know what they're doing, that, you, you know, God will look over that. Surely he knows how we are today. No, he does not see how we are today. Instead, God is looking down saying, you better fly right, church, because one of these days I'm coming and I'm going to give everybody according to their works, according to the Bible. Whether it's good or whether it's evil, they're going to get what they have deserved. And you say, I don't like to hear that. Well, friend, that may be true, but you have underestimated God if that's what you believe. He owns everything. Everything is derived by him. And it's held together by him. I quoted this this morning. Let me do it again. Colossians 1.16, for everything was created by him in heaven and on earth the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him. Friend in him means the Lord. He is the one who has held everything together thus far. Do you realize that you are all like the planetary system in one way? That every atom in your body has a purpose. There are things that are spinning around those atoms all the time. There are things within the atoms that are spinning around. They're in the course that God has chosen for them. And it is those forces that cause us to stick together. You say, no, we're stick together because we're human. Well, friend, you're made out of the very same things as the dust of the earth because you came from the dust of the earth. And if it were not for God's master plan, you would fly apart like dust on the road between here and Rollins. If you've never been on that road in the summertime, you know how dusty it can get. That's just what we would be if God was not holding us all together. Those of you who are science buffs, go check me out on this, please. It's called fact checking, and I welcome it. You are here because God is holding you and all of us together. Now, when he comes in the end, all things that belong to him are going to be reconciled to him. And all things that are not are going to be destroyed. Everything like that is coming down. And his judgment is going to be based on one precept. 
And it's this, if I didn't build it, it cannot stand. He will not leave anything standing that says you can defy God and get away with it. Now, so far, that's a pretty negative message, isn't it? Yep. And it was purposeful. But I want you to know the gospel's full of good news too. If it's the real gospel, it's got some of that other stuff and then it's got the good stuff. And the last thing that's going to come down is what I want to finish preaching about. How many of you have got enough resolve to listen to me for another 10 minutes? If you do, say amen. amen. All right. Revelation 21.1. And I saw a new heaven and new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Friend, that second verse says it all. One of these days, we're going to see something else coming down. And it's not going to be the things that mankind have built up. It's going to be the things that God is sending down. New Jerusalem, a new heaven a new earth. You see, I never have understood all that stuff at the end of the Bible. You know what? I haven't understood it all either. But I do know this. I love what I do understand because I can just see it all right now. I've read about how big that city is, a cube that is immense. I've read about the, the way it's fashioned with walls of jasper and streets of gold, city gates that are made out of out of enormous jewels. Beautiful. Go so clear you can see right through it. And I can just see that coming down out of heaven. It's coming down because it's going to replace all that God has torn down. Don't miss that. He'll tear down what's not real to put in its place that which is truly real. Now, I told you I'd do this quickly, so listen quickly. When all that opposes God is taken out of the way, Satan is going to fall. I hate him. That old devil is a rotten rascal. Amen? Amen? I don't think there's hardly anything that could be considered good about him. They said that he was, uh, sorry Jamie, but he was at one time the music minister there in heaven. Uh, he was in charge of all the, the music and, and the most beautiful angel that was there. And since he was exposed and got kicked out of heaven and took a third of all the angels in heaven with him, permeated this earth with a lot of evil, since that time, you have been his enemy. And all of his effort has been to bring you down. If he can get you to sign on to some of the new philosophies to build things up through mankind, then what he has done essentially is brought you down. Because you were created to get on your face before God and worship him. You were not created to invent new ways. To say, hey, I've got this all figured out now. No, that's, that's not what you were made for. You were made in his image to bow down before him and say, he is my Lord. Amen? That's essential for you to have a relationship with God. Say, he is the one that I owe everything to. And so, friend, Satan who is not built by God to do what he's doing, is going to fall. Listen to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. 
Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. That word letteth there could be translated prevents. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even his whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. And friend, I want you to know those who are allowing Satan to work will be destroyed right along beside him. I'm amazed at how many people are convinced, drawn into helping Satan out. I used to work for Satan. I can tell you all about him. I, I say that sh ashamedly. But I was, I was one of his best agents. If it was bad, I, I tried it. I wish my testimony were different. But I know how he works. He comes and he says, I'm going to build you up. I'm going to give you this and give you that. I'm going to help you. I'm here for you. But the last, no, he is here to tear you down. He'll take what was one time precious in the eyes of God in your relationship with him. And the next thing you know, Satan will have you serving him, looking toward some other heavenly body, certainly not God. So you need to understand that the old devil, he's, he, in, our, in our sense, he is to be hated, to, to be destroyed. I can't wait to see what he gets. And I know it's going to be a terrible, terrible outcome. You need to let him work in your life. Not Satan, but God. Because anything else is going to be destroyed. When New Jerusalem comes down, everything else is going to be melted away. There will be no evil left. <laughs> what a world that's going to be. Amen? Amen. I, I think that's just awesome. No more telephone scammers. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? How, how many of you how many of you have had a scammer who has tried to scam you over and over and over and over? You know, I've, I've got this one who, who, who wants me to know that on my 2014 Versa, with 160,000 miles on it, that they just discovered that my warranty had expired. <laughs> I've heard that so many times in so many different accents that anymore I just laugh and hang up I'm tired of the evil how about y'all I don't know about you but I don't want to see any more lady swimmers who are shaving that's not what I'm after I, I, I don't want to see any more world where people are so confused even by our own systems, that we don't know who we are. I don't want to see a world any longer where they, in some places in America, they can take a small child in school and begin to tell them that they need to have the freedom to decide whether they're going to be a man or a woman. Friend, look up here at this old preacher. A six-year-old does not have a clue about a man or a woman. How could they ever choose whether they want to be one or the other? Now, there may be some young people here right now saying, oh, Brother John, you, you, you're just so, so intolerant. <laughs> There's a reason. When he comes, I don't want him destroying me because I thought it was okay. How about you all? It's all going to come down. But boy, what a world it's going to be. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> it's already starting to crumble. And when everything starts to come down, it'll come apart. But what a day that will be. That old song says it like this, what a day it will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, what a day, glorious day that will be. One of those days, the Lord is coming back. And he's going to say, as he comes in the air, it's all down. Now I'm going to build it back up. There's a place up there that's got my name on it. I have got a place. King James calls it a mansion. I don't know how big it is. It better be pretty good size. Amen. But nonetheless, wherever it is, 
It's mine. You can't have it. Got my name on it. You say, well, John Smith's up there. No, no, no. I got a new name written down in glory. Nobody knows it but the Lord. Amen. Woo! Glory be to God. Some of you are not too excited about that, but you've not tried to sign into motels your whole life. <laughs> Hallelujah! I got a new name and written down in glory. Got a new place. No sickness. None. I'm the bionic man. I've got more parts that I didn't have when I came into this world than you can imagine. But here I stand tonight saying one of these days, Brother Jake, I'm going to be just like that cripple we sing about. There is no one else like that in the kingdom of God. One of these days, it's going to be utopia. And we won't need a Putin to lead us there. Amen? All we're going to need is to follow Jesus, the one who died for us. You say, Brother John, why did you preach this tonight? should be evident to you. I hope that you saw it. We're going to have to get excited about the fact that it's all coming down. We get pretty excited when things are built up. But one of these days, it's all going to come down. Now, I know you're all thinking about a building project here. I'm not talking about that. Anything built for God, truly for God, will stand. Amen? This church is a testament for that. For those of you who are not really savvy on, on this church and its history, this is the oldest continuing church in the state of Illinois. There's some that are a little bit older, but they ceased to be churches for a long, long time and then were reconstituted. This church right here is the oldest. 1820, Abraham Lincoln was a squirt. Amen. You want to know why it's still standing? Because the way it was built. You're, you are blessed to be in a place like this. It was built on, on the foundations that God had set up. You know what? If I lived in this area, this is where I would be in church. I'd have to get rid of Jake first. Amen. But this, this would be a good place to come. Because I know how it's built. And I know the church is going to stand. The real church is going to stand. Did you hear what I just said? Are you a part of the real church? You can't become a part of the real church by signing your name on a book. You can't become a part of the real church by saying, you know what, I think I ought to be a Christian. That's not the way you get there. You get there through being convinced of the Spirit of God, that you're a sinner, that you need to be saved. That's the way we all come into his presence. You get there by repenting and confessing and believing, having faith, believing that only God can save you from your condition. So if you're sitting out there tonight and you're in that category, you ought to say, hallelujah, let her come, Lord, because whatever comes is going to be good for me. And if you're not, if you're not sure, then right now, if I were you, I would begin to think about it. And here's why. It's all coming down. Everything you built up outside of God is going to crumble. And only those who are built on the foundation are going to stand. There's more to that little parable about the houses built on the sand or the rock than what you might think. <laughs> you know who Jesus calls himself? A rock. A rock that cannot fall, cannot be crushed. Are you standing on the rock tonight? We'll give you an opportunity to come to Christ. But the invitation tonight starting out is more broad than that. I guess the term is broader instead of more broad, but I do that every once in a while so my son will hear it and complain. I want to in invite you tonight to grasp what I've tried to share with you and say, Lord, whatever the cost, I'm going to be right here standing, waiting for you, believing you're coming soon. The Bible says watch carefully. We don't know when he's coming. It could be tonight. 
Nothing prevents that from happening. And you say, well, think of all that would have to be destroyed. Didn't you hear the way I started this? One goofy, evil man with just one little press of his finger can begin the annihilation of this world as we now know it. And all that will be left standing are those who are on the rock. Get on the rock tonight. And if you're already there, would you pray tonight that you would be found faithful and standing strong when the Lord does return because he is coming back.